Hey guys, Dmike here for another episode of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. We just cleaned up the Valley Windworks and we slathered some honey on this wobbly tree out front. So let's go ahead and see what amazing Pokemon awaits us here. What are we gonna get? Oh, okay. So anyway, sometimes the honey trees can be kind of hit or miss, which is more likely to be missed because encounter rates aren't great. And to reiterate once again, I won't be catching anything that can't be found normally in Sinnoh. So I Sinnoh OG Pokemon. So we'll leave that tree and come back another time after slathering it with honey. I went back to the Honey Man and you can buy 10 more. for a thousand Poké Dollars, I believe. So that's really nice. We've got quite a few battles ahead of us and Samuel needs an opportunity to gain some experience. So in the meantime of slathering honey on the tree, we'll train him up and see where we get going. This video is basically the entire northern section of Route 205 and all the battles that are stashed within. So fun fact about Ponyta, I guess maybe it's not really a fun fact, it's kind of a sad fact, is that Ponyta and Chimchar are two of the only fire Pokemon that are in the early beginnings of the Sinnoh decks. Now, that's true for the original Diamond and Pearl. That information may not be a thousand percent accurate here on Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. However, that's a big reason why I chose Chimchar, because if you don't have Chimchar on your team and you don't like Ponyta, then you're just kind of SOL when it comes to fire Pokemon. And I feel like fire Pokemon are really versatile and a lot of fun. So I usually try to keep one on my team in some form. And there's nothing wrong with Ponyta. I think Ponyta, its evolution, Rapidash are both really nice Pokemon. So if you're not really into the fire monkey Chimchar line, then maybe Ponyta is kind of more up your alley might ignite your passions a little bit. So there you go. Also, Ponyta is one of the Pokemon that was featured in Gold and Silver that had a pre-evolution, which never actually made it into the final game, which is kind of sad because it was a cute little mini pony, looked like a mini horse, like a little Sebastian, along with Growlithe, Tangela, 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 however you say that, and a few others. What's actually really interesting is that if you go and look at the beta sprites for Pokemon Gold and Silver, you'll see that a lot of those Pokemon that were in that game, are planning to be in that game, didn't eventually wind up making it, unfortunately. And we'll never know why. Some of their designs were a little bit, I would say, kind of rudimentary, kind of basic. Looked like they were potentially placeholders, but there were also plenty of designs that you could tell were intended to actually be, you know, fully fledged Pokemon. A lot of the pre-evolution sprites could have probably used some cleaning up, but if we're being completely honest and fair, a lot of the designs of Pokemon back in those early generations were kind of basic in and of themselves, just because the games were kind of in their early fledgling stage. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's interesting that those Pokemon didn't actually wind up making it into the final gold and silver roster, which makes you think, you know, why? What what was the reasoning behind that? And did they ultimately become something else? Did they just get canceled for saying inappropriate things on Twitter? Who knows? But there are examples that I think are really interesting is that the line of Pokemon in the case of like maybe Doduo and Dodrio, they also had a pre-evolution, which if I was smart and I had the time to do it, I would go and, you know, toss these up on screen, but I don't really want to throw off the flow of this amazing Let's Play. So they did have a pre-evolution, which I don't know any of the names of them, obviously, because they were Japanese names, but the pre-evolution to Doduo, which if we're counting here at D-Mike Industries, we do know basic math sometimes. Doduo, Duo 2, Dodrio, Trio, three. Pre-evolution of Doduo had three necks. 
coming out of an egg. It looked kind of like a like a baby vulture, to be honest. And it had three heads coming out of that of that egg shell. Now I'm not entirely sure going from three to two to three what implications those have, but I think it is interesting that that was the choice they made. Or maybe the duo was supposed to be you know phased out in some way and that was gonna replace it. I have no idea. But I think it's interesting. Probably maybe a little more interesting than these very basic trainer battles, but you know, it is what it is. And there's a lot of thought that goes into those early games, and I know that there's actually some channels out there on YouTube specifically that kind of dig into beta information, which I find pretty interesting. If you're bored and you're kind of looking for some additional things maybe to watch while you're having lunch, while you're snacking on a Bidoof, um, yeah, go and check some of that stuff out. If you ever find yourself really hyped after watching D Mike destroy Hiker Daniel, then that's a good place for you to be. So we're gonna pick up this X attack, which in this case, we're not gonna probably wind up using that one. The X defense was actually just kind of a spur of the moment choice that I made in the battle against Roark because my the majority of my team, if you notice, the only Pokemon on my team that actually was going to potentially do anything was Burt. So speaking of, there's a nice Bidoo here, which I still think its sprite is a little strange looking. A little phallic, but um, that X defense actually proved to be the difference maker because I had a couple of prior attempts there where I wanted to strategize a little bit and I was incapable of doing that. My strategy failed and I did not use that X defense and it did lead to my doom. So I don't want to say it was the complete game changer, but you know, maybe it did a little bit. I'm thankful for it. I don't really use those because I'm not trying to, you know, do a speed run. Where usually that's kind of what I've seen in the past is speedrunning a Pokemon game usually results in the one Pokemon being chosen as kind of the the run doer. I don't know what you would call that. You know, they just they pick one that's you know apparently really suitable for certain things, and then they just juice it up with a bunch of X defense, a bunch of X attack, blah, blah, blah. They set up for a while and then they just sweep everything, which I, I mean, I get it, but I don't know if I necessarily think that's 100% interesting to watch. So I'm actually trying to step outside my comfort zone here and provide content that is interesting for once. So there you go. And what's also interesting, this sneaky antidote. So if you ever wind up poisoned, an antidote is always useful, especially if you actually have to look for one. That's very helpful when you're potentially keeling over from some sort of a snake bite. Also, something to be mindful of is that something that's poisonous versus something that's venomous are not the same thing. Venomous usually, I believe in this case, is something that attacks you in the case of a snake, maybe giving you a chow. And poisonous is something that you consume that can make you sick. So you can essentially wind up poisoned by either of those things, you know, by snake venom or maybe you eat some poisonous berries or, you know, you're chomping on a tree frog as you do sometimes. So just be mindful of that. Don't go, don't go be, don't go doing any of that. If you're going to do anything with the tree frog, maybe give it a little and see how that makes you feel. Maybe hallucinate, have some cool dreams for a while. Make sure you're with friends, somebody who can walk you through the process. But anyway, back to battling. This entire route is kind of long and I think that it's the game's kind of opportunity to be like okay show me what you're made of now a lot of these battles for the most part aren't relatively difficult but there are quite a few of them in a row before you'll have any opportunity to really go back and you know heal yourself now could you go back to Jubilife and you know heal yourself if you needed to yeah you could do that but here at DMike Industries we like to kind of brute force things. And I mean, if you've got enough potions and, you know, you're swapping your Pokemon in and out, whatnot, you'll be fine. Especially when you're going to be facing this generation's Pikachu. So something that I think is interesting. I mean, most things that I say in this video, I would assume that I think are interesting. Do you think that they're interesting? Who knows? But something that I think is interesting, first off, me using Recover, which I never do, but it is pretty effective if you want to save yourself some items, which I sometimes forget that I even have that move, and then I will waste potions. So, recover, a cool move. 
I think the top of Samuel's head reminds me of one of those kind of jello mold cakes from the 1950s where if you've ever seen one of those old cookbooks, for whatever reason, they thought that making jello cakes savory was a good idea. I've seen photos where they would put fruit in them, which it doesn't sound bad. You know, fruit in, in a jello cake, gelatin, whatever. I guess jello is technically the brand name. Would be okay, you know? I mean, because jello gelatin itself is fruit flavored usually. I mean, you can just buy unflavored gelatin to make things, like a nice mousse perhaps, but the jello that I saw had savory recipes alongside it, in which case I saw people using tuna and mayonnaise and hot dogs, and no. No, 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 no. We don't do that. I don't want to live in any sort of dystopian world where, first off, we can't whoop children at Pokemon, and secondly, where we think that putting those types of foods in gelatin is ever a good idea. That is a hard line in the sand that I will draw with my pinky toe and say no thank you. But yeah, what are your favorite desserts? What, what are the things that get you going besides maybe savory gelatin? What does it for you? And would you eat savory gelatin as the dessert or would you eat it as an entree? Would you have savory gelatin for an entree and then maybe have dessert gelatin to follow it up just to keep things all in the same family? Whatever you're into? Who knows? But I usually stay away from the gelatins and puddings and the I don't know why I said it like that, puddings of the world. It's normally a texture issue for me. It doesn't really set well, but that's neither here nor there. Some people probably really enjoy that. I know that putting putting into something, like potentially a pie, can be really, really nice, but I would say in general, it's not something that I'm gonna go out of my way to find. If somebody makes it and was like, hey, I made this dessert that's got pudding in it, would you like to try it? Yeah, I'll probably try, I'll probably give it a go pretty open-minded when it comes to stuff. I can be kind of picky because I know what I like, but I will usually try most things at least once. That's how it goes. That's the way he goes. So let's continue along. I think it's interesting that this hiker says that he is lost when there are at least a dozen people on this route he could have talked to so far. I've been hiking before. I think it's a really fun activity depending upon how difficult it is. I'm not a pro hiker, so I do struggle sometimes that the ones that have a lot of elevation or long hikes if it's hot. But hiking in general is pretty fun unless you make a wrong turn and then you're going to wind up climbing a mountain by yourself. So you don't want to do that. If you ever get lost, make sure you turn back and find some familiar place or person. Getting stuck in the woods with a couple of granola bars and a half bottle of water is not really a good way to survive. So if you never gain anything of value from this Let's Play, at the very least, you learned not to get lost in the woods by yourself. Compliments of Dean Mike Industries. You're welcome. So our Pokemon are continuing to grow. Thanks to the experience all it is pretty useful and keeping things pretty leveled out, relatively even within the game, which is kind of nice. I still feel like it's cheesing it, but who knows. So we finally find somebody who's not trained to hold back, because everybody else at this point was holding back. She is not. Battle girl Kelsey? Yeah. She's ready to kick into action. Yeah, this entire area I think is really interesting because of the setting that they've got. You know, it's very mountainous, obviously, you can see that. I like the image of Mount Coronet in the background. Mount Coronet is interesting as a plot device. Plot setting, I guess. It could be considered a plot device, I guess, but it's a setting that, inf that influences the plot that is not only present in this game, and I like the idea that it will be a huge part of the upcoming Pokemon game. Legends, Arceus, Arceus, Legends, whatever the order of those words is. That's going to be coming out soon, next month, in January. And that game is set in Ye old Sinnoh. Should be a lot of fun to 
kind of parallel that game with this one. I'm not going to be playing that game on this channel, obviously, because I'm going to do one game at a time, but I think the idea of having a game that is kind of like a Breath of the Wild and Pokemon together seems really fascinating. Not as fascinating as the move Endeavor, which is garbage, so we will not be using that in any capacity. I'm going to be trying to be more understanding of non-offensive moves, and if there's something cool that I can use, I will use it. Like in this case, Spark. Spurt. It's really nice because right now, Steven has a higher attack stat, and Spark is a physical electric move, which there aren't a ton of. It's usually a special variety of a typing, but we will use that to replace Thundershot because it is stronger, and it takes advantage of the attack stat. So, very good. It could also potentially inflict paralysis, so it's essentially a better Thundershot. And sometimes you have to do that. Choose one move that maybe has a little bit less of... less PP, smaller PP. Less opportunities to use it, but it might be a little bit stronger and kind of more fitting with the stat layout of your Pokémon. So just keep that in mind. Or don't. Literally play this game however you want to. It's Pokémon. It's not difficult, so you can do whatever you want. I do enjoy, though, going back to the Mount Coronet thing that I was trying to talk about. It hasn't in, been introduced in the game, so this is huge spoilers. There's a, there's a Mount Coronet in this game, guys. There's a mountain. Spoilers. And I think it's cool that, as an aesthetic, they fade it in at the beginning of every Pokemon battle. And then you can see it behind the character right here, as well as behind the opponent. So I think they did a really nice job with that. And... It's used in the game quite a few times. I know that as a set piece that you will be exploring that location. It's not just for looks. And some big important things happen there. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind of what to expect in the future. We will see. I don't want to spoil what you'll do there, but we will be traversing that mountain. We will be making the, the climb. And we'll have to use HMs to do it, but thankfully in this game, you don't have to use HMs on your Pokemons, so... I don't quite remember which of the Pokemon games was the first one to get rid of HMs as a move slot in the overworld. I want to say it was Sun and Moon, but it could have been X and Y. One of those generations was the one where they would essentially have other Pokemon fulfill that role which is nice. So it looks like Samuel, as he levels up, will learn Water Pulse, which I think is a really interesting move. I think Water Pulse was introduced in Ruby and Sapphire. It was kind of a... I want to say it was part of the... Let me think. It was part of the... I have to really think about what the names of the Pokemon are. My goodness. I just forget. I know it was the Water Starter's kind of main dig. Because I believe that Pokemon was supposed to come back like a Salamander, or like a, uh... Maybe some sort of like a Gecko, I don't know. And Water Pulse was a move that it learned early. It's really nice as a Water-type move, it's a special move, and it can potentially confuse. Which is nice, because I feel more in tune with moves that confuse, because I am also confused a lot of the time. That's great. Not as great as a Super Potion which we will now take a look at for a moment, as well as Awakening, which lets you wake your Pokemon up. Shocking. It's like a, maybe a, a smelling salt super potion. Basically does the same thing as a potion. Heals 60 instead of 20. And we've also got some berries here. And this is also a waste because this house, directly to the north of where I'm at, will give you a full heal. So that was dumb of me to use that berry, that's okay. We will probably acquire many berries that we will consume throughout the course of this game. So this nice woman and her young bug catching son, I mean, maybe it's not her son, maybe she kidnapped this boy, um, are going to let us stay in their little cottage here, heal up on our way to a turn of forest, which is going to be right here. So here we go, everybody. This is the Next place we'll be popping into, because we can't go anywhere else. If you go to the north here, you'll see that it's currently blocked off by some trees that, unfortunately, when watered, do not turn into Sudowoodo. 
So it looks like we only have one place to go. And that place to go is not the left either. That's actually a way to get back to Route 205 from another direction, which we'll do in the future. But instead, for now, we're going to head into Eterna Forest next time. So thanks for watching, everybody. I've been D-Mike. This has been Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, and I'll see you next time. Bye.